Just a quick word from our sponsor, Post Investment Group. Have you ever considered real estate investment but aren't sure where to begin? Also, maybe you don't want to own an entire property but want to put some money towards real estate. If so, syndications with Post Investment Group may be the right fit where a bunch of people come together to pitch in to make an investment affordable for everyone. On top of that, what I really love about Post is their focus on affordable housing. And we all know in medicine how much housing can be such a big player in someone's health. So government subsidized units, Section 8, Section 42, and then also workforce housing or middle income. Think essential workers but they cannot necessarily afford the high rent in today's economic time. It really creates a win-win situation, both for your financial future, as well as helping others in need of affordable housing. If this piques your interest at all, schedule a call with Adam Krasakis from Post, who can give you personalized guidance without any strings attached. I am constantly on the phone answering questions, helping you understand what you're investing in, whether it's right for you. The reason I syndicate real estate investments is to give regular people the access to the benefits of investing in real estate. And I just think about that every single day because that really is true. So schedule a call, no strings attached, to learn more about real estate syndications at coreampodcast.com backslash post. Again, coreampodcast.com backslash post. Hi, everyone. Welcome to Coream. I'm Dr. Shreya Trivedi, and today I'm joined by the lovely Dr. Erin Dunn, soon to be a nocturnist somewhere in this country and whose voice you might remember from our Five Pearls episode on Pacemakers and Icy. Hey, everyone. I'm happy to be back. If you feel like you didn't get enough from our first episode on pacemakers and ICDs, we're coming at you with round two. Yeah, these are questions that come up all the time, but didn't make it to our original five pearls on implantable devices. So let's get started with some of the mini pearls that we'll be covering in rapid fire for this episode. Test yourself by pausing after each of the five questions. Pearl one, framework for syncope. Should we approach syncope history differently in our patients with pacemakers and ICDs? Pearl 2, considerations for patients with implantable devices before surgery. Pearl 3, considerations for patients with implantable devices before MRI. Pearl 4, anticoagulation in patients undergoing pacemaker or ICD procedures. Pearl 5, emerging cardiac device technology and how they might look different on EKG or chest x-ray. Right, let's get started. Starting with syncope. Here we're talking about someone having a brief decrease in blood pressure leading to inadequate perfusion of the brain, leading to loss of consciousness. So Aaron, let's say you have a new patient coming in with syncope. It probably happens once a week or so or more. What is your general framework for this? Yeah, one of the things I've learned is to think about syncope in three big buckets. Number one, reflex syncope, which usually is vasovagal. Number two, orthostatic, whether it's the autonomic nervous system, hypovolemia, or a medication side effect. And number three is cardiogenic syncope, which can be due to abnormal heart rhythm or to a valvular disease. And it's also important to rule out common mimics, things like hypoglycemia or seizures. And there's a really great clinical problem solvers framework that you can check out as well. Oh yeah, I really like that one too. We also sat down with Dr. Andy Locke, an electrophysiologist at Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center, and asked him, his approach to history taking for syncope and if it changes, if the patient has an implantable device. I think people think that cardiologists or electrophysiologists do something special with the syncope evaluation. And like, we really don't. So, so essentially taking a step back away from the, the fact that they have a device, really, whether they have a device or not, the initial evaluation is the same, clinic, the clinical evaluation. So when you see a patient with syncope, you want to go talk to them and get a clinical history because the history for syncope is 95% of the evaluation. Yeah, I always feel like such a good medicine doctor when I can uncover that critical piece of someone's story. Same, same. Gives me so much life. So when we see patients for syncope, we want to know whether prodromal symptoms, do they feel lightheaded? Did they, did they feel something coming on? Did they feel a wave of, of, of diaphoresis, of nausea? Were they eating? Were they going to the bathroom in the middle of the night? Yep. For example, any mention of toilet, for example, leading up to syncope, I'm almost always thinking vasovagal. Versus something like exertional syncope, that red flag has a pretty small differential. Arrhythmias, outflow obstruction, hokum, aortic stenosis, PE, pulmonary hypertension, they're all things that come to mind with an exertional syncope history. Right. That context is so important. And as humble as Dr. Locke is that EPs don't really do anything differently, he did bring up part of the history that I didn't appreciate as much. And then what's key and what people forget about 
is how did they feel when they woke up? So if someone felt totally washed out and exhausted for minutes to even an hour or two hours or three hours after, that's almost certainly a vasovagal episode. Those episodes are not life-threatening arrhythmias. Arrhythmia, clinical history of arrhythmias, I was feeling fine. Maybe I felt a little lightheaded or maybe I felt nothing and boom, I was gone. I woke up 30 seconds later, 10 minutes later, an hour later, and I felt completely normal. And that's the people you should be worrying about, the people that had abrupt onset syncope with no symptoms following the event. Think Brady or tachyarrhythmia as an etiology. Wow. I don't know if I would paid enough attention to how a patient felt when they woke up, if they felt exhausted or if they felt totally normal. Yeah, same. I, I feel like I always learn to pay attention to those prodromal symptoms. If someone had them, then that pointed to more vasovagal orthostasis. But if someone didn't have those symptoms before they syncopized and it was more of that lights out syncope, it was more concerning for an arrhythmia. But Dr. Locke clarified that those prodromal symptoms pointing to one bucket is actually not a hard and fast rule. And that's especially true in our more elder and frail patients. Now, what is important to remember is leading up to when someone syncopizes, if it is from an arrhythmia, you can feel palpitations, you can feel nausea, you can feel diaphoresis, you can feel those kind of more reflex syncope symptoms, those prodromal symptoms that we kind of really focus on. So in, in that sense, it can be a little difficult to parse out. But almost always when they wake up, that's the key, asking them, how did you feel when you came to? If patients are confused, if they lost bowel or bladder, uh, you know, they were incontinent, um, and if the confusion lasts hours, you know, thinking about seizure, if they felt totally washed out afterwards, exhausted for hours to even up to a day, that's more consistent with reflex syncope, vasovagal syncope, which is the most common form of that. And then if they woke up and they felt kind of fine, they were scared and a little confused, but they, but they felt okay. They were able to interact with medical staff. That's when you want to think that an arrhythmia had, had a role. Yep. Again, reiterates the big takeaway for me that it's how someone feels after passing out that can really help distinguish between that benign vasovagal episode and a life-threatening arrhythmia. Yeah. And then for me, the takeaway with this one is that those prodromal symptoms can be present in cardiac syncope also. And actually, after talking to Dr. Locke, I went back and looked at the JAMA Rational Clinical Exam Series syncope article. And the likelihood ratios for things like pallor, blurry vision, awareness of being faint, diaphoresis, nausea, actually, those likelihood ratios are not overwhelming. Some cross one and are not as helpful in differentiating cardiac syncope versus other causes. So let's dive deeper into pacemakers and ICDs and really common questions that come up. Yep. Next up is a situation we've all had. A patient with a pacemaker or ICD is going for a surgery or going down for an MRI and you get that MRI question here. So how do we triage these patients with an implantable device? Let's start with surgery in this mini pearl and then tackle MRI in the next mini pearl. So before surgery and before MRI, it, th these are good times to contact us. Um, so what, what you have to think about in these situations is you want to avoid a situation where a patient gets an inappropriate shock if they have an ICD. And you want to make sure that someone who needs pacing is getting paced and it's uninterrupted during the time of surgery or the MRI, okay? Surgery is a little bit easier for us. So, so if a surgery is a, below the iliac crest, you typically do not need to involve us, okay? If it's above that, you should involve us. Uh, often what, is, what we're able to do, you can put what's called a magnet on a device. Pacemakers, when they see a magnet, no matter the manufacturer, change to an asynchronous mode of pacing, which means I will pace, but I am not listening to anything around me. I am not doing anything in response to anything. I'm, I don't care. I'm going to pace no matter what I see, because I'm going to make sure that this patient's getting paced. Okay. So surgery inferior to the iliac crest does not usually require any changes to the pacemaker, but for surgery superior to the iliac crest, we should get cardiology involved so that they can place a magnet. Yeah. And when that magnet gets placed on the pacemaker, it's going to change the mode so that it keeps the pacemaker pacing, but not sensing. And this is to prevent the pacemaker from sensing any cautery and reacting to that. And that would really be bad news. Yeah, that would be really bad. I kind of think about the asynchronous pacing mode, like those professional athletes or musicians who are just in that state of flow. 
and they just do without reacting to anything in the outside world. Man, Aaron, I love that analogy. I feel like that's like my dream as a doctor to just like be in this flow state and not react to the many curveballs of the day. And like <laughs> same in my yeah, in my best states, I'm like, yes, achieving. <laughs> but anyways, um, as we're talking about magnets turning off pacemakers ability to sense, I am wondering if that might bring up issues too. The only time you run into issues with that is if someone's intrinsic heart rate is faster than the the magnet rate. Um, so if you if someone has intermittent heart block, for example, and you, they're going to go for surgery, and you want to make sure they don't have heart block during surgery, if you're going to set an asynchronous mode, someone may be conducting normally, and you're going to pace on top of that. That could be a problem. You could get what we learned about in med school, known as an R and T response. An R and T response is when you are depolarizing the heart during repolarization phase during the during the T wave. An R being a QRS and a T being the T wave. And that can cause torsade, um, you know, polymorphic VT. And that's bad. So we don't want to do that. So you want to make sure when you're doing an asynchronous mode that you're safely programming it. So you're trying to be safe for the patient and making sure they get pace when they need to, but you're not making a dangerous situation. I guess a good thing here is that cardiology can be really helpful um, in helping us think about the underlying rhythm, such as intermittent heart block, and if we can just put a magnet for asynchronous pacing, or if we need to program the pacemaker in another way to prevent this complication during surgeries above the iliac crest. So that's pacemakers. But what about patients undergoing surgery who have defibrillators or ICDs? How is that different? Yeah. And before we get into that, I think what might be helpful is just two quick space-based repetitions from our original episode on the difference between pacemakers and ICDs. So first, we typically think of pacemakers as treating slow rhythms. And ICDs is treating fast, dangerous rhythms. And ICDs do this by either delivering a shock or antitachycardial pacing. And then the second quick point is that ICDs can do everything a pacemaker can. So ICDs can pace too. And this is important because magnets do something different to ICDs than they do to pacemakers. With defibrillators, magnet modes disable ICD therapy, but they don't affect pacing. So if someone's cauterizing right around, you know, the thyroid or the lung or something near, if an ICD sees that, it will shock a patient because it thinks it's VT. If you disable that, great, you're not going to get a shock. But if a person needs pacing, you are inhibiting them. So if someone has a defibrillator and they're going for surgery, but say they also have a pacing indication, instead of a magnet, we're going to have to physically go there and program the device because a magnet will only shut off the ICD therapy. Okay. So if you put a magnet on an ICD, it only turns off the shocks. But the pacemaker part of the ICD is still going to be sensing and pacing. And that might cause a problem for someone who's dependent on the pacemaker if it thinks the cautery is actually an electrical signal from the heart. Yes. Yeah, so here, our friendly cardiologist is going to need to do some additional pr reprogramming with the ICD prior to surgery. All right. So Aaron, uh, I think this could be a good place to pause and recap this quick pearl on cardiac devices before surgery. Yeah, when you have a patient with a pacemaker or ICD who needs surgery, first thing, is the surgery above or below the iliac crest? If it's below, they're likely in the clear. But if it's above the iliac crest, cardiology should usually be involved. In the case of a pacemaker, they can place a magnet and change it into that asynchronous pacing mode. And for an ICD, they may need to do additional reprogramming. <music> All right, Aaron, I feel like now I have a good sense of how to triage prior to surgery based on if it's a pacemaker or an ICD, particularly if it's above or below the iliac crest. What about MRIs and what do we do with our patients who need to go down for an MRI? MRI is a little tricky because MRI, these devices, the newer devices are now MRI conditional or compatible, but they, there are a lot of devices out there that are not FDA approved. So first, the first thing I'll take, just take a step back. It is safe for patients who have a cardiac device to get an MRI under almost every condition, but with the proper monitoring, okay? So, so for a patient to get one of these devices and to come in and, and, you know, during an interview, they say, you know, doc, my, my cardiologist told me I can't get an MRI. That's typically not true. It, assuming you have the proper monitoring. You have to set up these, you know, the right pacing modes and all these things. It takes a lot of resources. So, so we need to be involved. We need to make some programming changes. We need radiology to be okay with it. Um, 
but it's uh, it's doable. That's definitely a learning point for me. I'd always thought there were kind of two buckets, MRI compatible pacemakers and MRI incompatible pacemakers. But it actually sounds like nearly all pacemakers are okay for MRI, as long as certain steps are taken for programming and monitoring during the MRI. Yeah. And maybe another way to think about it is there, there are these devices that are intrinsically compatible and then the other bucket is compatible after modification. Ooh, I like that. And just to be explicit, MRI, like cautery and surgery, can interfere with the normal function of a pacemaker. And, and also, it can even dislodge the leads or heat them up and burn the local myocardium if the right protocols are not in place, which sounds really scary. Yeah, that is something we definitely want to avoid. The biggest blessing of all of this is that hospitals and clinics often have specific protocols to reduce the risk. Okay, so to sum up, I think the big takeaway here is that patients with pacemakers and ICDs can undergo an MRI. Cardiology will likely need to be involved to help reprogram the device before the scan, monitor the patient during the scan, depending on what type of device and leads the patients have. Next up on common questions that come up surrounding pacemakers and ICDs, what type of anticoagulation is safe for patients undergoing a pacemaker or ICD procedure? If someone thinks that they need a pacemaker, what happens sometimes is patient comes in on DOAC, the team is like not sure if they need a pacer or a defibrillator. They stop the DOAC and start heparin. That's actually the opposite of what you should do. And a great pearl from this, a great pearl, what blood thinners are okay in interventional cardiology and what is okay in EP? And the answer is EP, never heparin. No, never can use heparin. But actually, there's good literature showing that DOACs, you can do implants on DOACs and it's safe. And it's actually safer than to interrupt and then restart anticoagulation. There actually have been two, two really well done randomized trials. So those two really well done randomized control trials are Bruce Control and Bruce Control 2, which both studied patients on anticoagulation before pacemaker or ICD placement. In Bruce Control, patients were randomized to continue warfarin or to bridge with heparin. And the study found that patients who were continued on warfarin had lower risk of pocket hematoma. And for Bruce Control 2, Patients were randomized to continue DOAC or hold DOAC without any bridging. And this study found that continuing DOAC wasn't really better or worse than holding it. That's really interesting. You know, I feel like knee-jerk reflex in the hospital is to hold someone's DOAC or long-acting anticoagulation and switch them to a heparin drip, right? That's faster on, faster off, peri procedure. But it sounds like with EP-related procedures like pacemaker or ICD placement, patients are actually better off if I avoid heparin products so no bridging, and just keep them on their home DOAC or warfarin. Yeah, I wonder why DOACs would be safer than heparin. Like you said, you know, heparin's kind of that fast on, fast off. That's how I always think about it too. So I would have assumed it'd be safer in this case, but it sounds like the evidence shows otherwise. For some reason, patients with, the, with this procedure, with vascular procedure in this area, there's way more device-related hematomas on heparin or heparin products versus Anticoagulants like like DOAX and, and Coumadin. I don't really know why. So EP, we're okay with oral anticoagulation. We're not okay with heparin because there's there is so much bleeding in the pocket that it's almost guaranteed that you'll develop a, a pocket hematoma. And any type of hematoma there is very high risk for infection, ongoing bleeding, needing to go back in and do a revision. And taking a deeper dive into the evidence, it looks like we should avoid heparin products for the days leading up to and at least 24 hours after a pacemaker or ICD is placed to lower that risk of pocket hematoma. Yeah, the more you access that pocket to say evacuate a hematoma, the more the infection rate skyrockets. And particularly if it leads to persistent bacteremia, that will then mean device removal, which we learned in our last episode is no easy procedure and carries a 1% serious complication rate. Aye, aye, aye. Yes, aye, 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 indeed. Aaron, do you want to summarize what we learned so far from this mini pearl? So to recap, it's okay to either continue or hold oral anticoagulation for a patient with an upcoming pacemaker or ICD placement. But bottom line, we should definitely avoid heparin products in these patients. All right, last but not least, we're going to end this episode looking into the future with Dr. Joshua Cooper, an electrophysiologist from Temple University with a glimpse of newer implantable devices and how we might see something on ECG or X-ray 
that we might not have expected. If you have somebody who has a conduction system pacing lead, you may see pacemaker spikes with a narrow QRS complex after that. That's not something that most non-electrophysiologists are used to seeing. And so you may be confused and say, I don't understand what's happening in this patient because I see pacing spikes, but I see narrow QRS complexes, and that's not what I'm used to. I'm used to a wide QRS, so left bundle branch block looking QRS. Why is that? Well, that's a new technique that we've been using in the past few years that you may not be aware of. That can lead to very funny EKG appearances. You may see that a patient's pacing and they have no scar in their upper chest and say, I don't know, you may do a chest x-ray and there's no pacemaker there. And you may not notice that there's a small little metal bullet-like uh, device inside the ventricle. That's a leadless pacemaker that you may not have known was a, a device that exists. Thinking back to our previous episode, Remember that leadless pacemakers are used for single chamber pacing, and because they don't have leads, they might be a good option for patients with high infection risk or patients with poor vascular access, so people on dialysis. Also, one of the things we learned when we were talking to Dr. Cooper is that some newer models of leadless pacemakers are being developed for the right atrium to promote AV synchrony, which would mean that more patients could benefit from these devices that have lower risk of infection. So... Being aware that technology is constantly changing, if you see a scenario that you just can't wrap your head around, that you don't understand what you're seeing, yet another scenario to it is at a minimum curbside, the electrophysiologist and say, I just don't understand what's happening in this patient. This EKG looks very funny to me. This x-ray looks very funny to me. What is that weird thing that I'm seeing in the body? In addition, and not to branch out in, uh, too far from our, our topic here, but there's also a new type of pacemaker that is not intended to treat the heart rhythm, but in fact, to increase contractility of the heart. It's a, called a CCM or a cardiac contractility modulation device. It has two leads that are implanted in the septum in the right ventricle and attached to what looks essentially like a pacemaker. Uh, but this type of pacemaker is delivering very high frequency, high energy signals to those two leads in the septum on top of sensed QRS complexes. And over time, that can modify gene transcription and the contraction of the myocytes to take a heart failure patient who has a low ejection fraction and heart failure and improve their cardiac contraction. Uh, not Again, not a defibrillator, not a pacemaker, but looks like a pacemaker on an x-ray and will give you funny looking signals some of the time on an EKG. But it's yet another new technology that we're starting to use nowadays that someone may not even understand what that is. In fact, a lot of patients may have more than one device in place. They may have an ICD on one side of their chest and a CCM device on the other side of their chest doing two different things. And in the future, there's going to be one device that will do all of the above, but that's not currently the case. So keeping up with this technology is not your job. It's our job. And certainly asking questions um, at any time is always uh, acceptable and encouraged. Wow. My jaw is on the floor. It's just amazing to hear about these new technologies and how some devices are impacting contractility and treating heart failure. What are you taking away from this, Pearl Shreya? Yeah, I think for me, I think the important takeaway is that when I'm looking at an EKG, now with new pacemakers, like conduction pacing devices, we're not going to see some of those classic bundle branch patterns that we're used to seeing. Yeah, and I also think when we're looking at the chest x-ray, it can be a little tricky. For someone with a leadless pacemaker, we won't even see the traditional generator and leads. And on the other hand, for someone with a cardiac contractility modulation device, we might see something that looks like a traditional pacemaker, but actually isn't. Tricky, but exciting. Yeah, I'm really impressed with these new technologies coming out. Uh, but it also reminds me just to stay humble and remember that we're going to continue learning and have some awesome cardiology colleagues to help us along. <music> Let's end with some quick, pithy summaries of our five mini pearls. Aaron, you want to take it away? Yeah. First, we talked about syncope. And one of my learning points is that prodromal symptoms like nausea or diaphoresis may not actually be as helpful as how someone feels after a syncopal episode. If they wake up and you know they feel like something's off, think about vasovagal or orthostasis. If they wake up and feel totally normal, think cardiac syncope. Yep. And for our second and third mini pearls, we talked about surgery and MRI for patients with cardiac devices. So one lesson is that cautery that's used in surgery or the MRI machine itself can interfere with some of the normal functioning of these devices. So the device may need to be reprogrammed, especially in surgeries above the iliac crest 
This could be as simple as leaving a magnet to turn that pacemaker into asynchronous pacing mode or getting cardiology to do some additional reprogramming with the ICD or those undergoing MRI. Next, we talked about anticoagulation. And we learned that it's really important to avoid heparin products in patients who are getting pacemaker or ICD procedures because that heparin can increase the risk of a pocket hematoma. And it's actually safe to continue their DOAC or warfarin. And finally, we ended with a great reminder to continue reading up on new technologies. And that is a wrap for this episode. If you found this episode helpful, please share it with your team, your colleagues. Give it a rating on Apple Podcasts or whatever podcast app you use. It really does help people find us. Tweet us, X at us, leave us a comment on our website, Instagram, or Facebook page. Thank you to Dr. Xu Yang, Dr. Greg Katz, Dr. Abby Gami, Dr. Evan Harmon, Dr. Sarah Schwartz, and Dr. Aaron Troy for reviewing this episode. As always, we love hearing feedback. Email us at hello at coreampodcast.com. Take care. Hey. Hey, hey, hey. <laughs> That's my favorite thing. Did you watch Power Rangers growing up? <laughs> I love that. Like, like whenever there's a, some terrible monster, Don tells like the lo- robot and the robot's like, ay, ay, ay. And I'm like, oh my gosh, that's me. Okay. Oh, 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 O'Reilly. You've got questions? O'Reilly Auto Parts has answers. Need a pro you can trust? We've got that too. No matter what you need, our professional parts people have the training and expertise to help you do things right. Deep automotive knowledge. Just one part that makes O'Reilly stand apart. The professional parts people. Oh, oh.